Joseph. And I'm Nick. And this is Fish Jelly. And what about it? How are you? Uh, I'm good. My ears are ringing still. From what? From last night. You went out last night. I did. Um, to Akbar because it was uh, uh, it was advertised as an R&B Divas night, but with a, a special tribute to Beyonce. That line, so I walked there. And that's the longest line I've ever seen at Akbar. It wrapped around the block. <laughs> but I walked there, which took a good, you know, 45 minutes. So I'm like, well, like, let me see how long this lasts. And it, to be fair, I probably was only in line like half an hour. Half an hour? Ugh. Well, anyway. But once I got in, so it turns out I think they played her new album that was supposed to end by 11. So that was about the time I got in. Uh, but the dance floor was really packed. And at first I was like, oh, this is going to be a nightmare to be here. But actually, after they stopped playing the new album, the dance floor thinned out again. And they would go back and forth uh, playing some of her old stuff as well. But I danced a lot. And there was actually kind of room to move around. So it was, it was a lot of fun. Oh, good for you. But my, I would, since I was on the dance floor for two hours, uh, my head is... <laughs> Because, you, you know, the acoustics in there are not really... It's a loud little room. Yep. Moving on. Uh, we got asked to talk about Zac Efron's face. Oh, boy. Poor thing. <laughs> well, he's saying there's been all this... He did a video, like Bill Nye had some video trying to promote something. and Science. Of course, science related, and he had a lot of celebrities making cameos, and one of them was Zac Efron, whose face looked very different from what we're used to, so that sparked a lot of conversation. And then he's at TIFF promoting a new movie of his. The Greatest Beer Run or something? Something about a beer run. Yeah. And, of course, it reignited this conversation about why does he look so different, and so he's saying that he slipped in like a puddle of water at his house and hit some granite surface and like broke his jaw and his jaw had to be wired shut and he almost died and that's why he looks different all of it sounds suspect to me but it's none of my damn business of course i've been reading about it and there are like plastic surgeons weighing in as they're want to do on people who they've never seen or touched before mm -hmm. which is fair i mean i can look at someone's hair and tell what's going on even though i've never touched them or seen them so um the comments i read from one plastic surgeon said that they don't think he's had surgery it looks more like there's like a dental thing going on like maybe he had teeth pulled but it's been a long time it's been like over a year that he's looked like this so yeah i don't know it's very suspect because he, he looks like his jaw has been enhanced. Yeah. And they gave him that sort of chiseled look. And then his lips look big. But everything's very symmetrical. Mm -hmm. So I'm just like, did but you hit this granite surface at the exact point in the center of your face that the swelling spread and went to your lips evenly? I don't know. But my first thought is, who cares? Like, yeah. But I also think when you're a person who has made millions of dollars and has become very famous because of how you look... I think it's very reasonable that people would question your appearance. Like, that seems fair. Sure. You know, to question a lady at the DMV about her lips and, you know, it's like, who cares? That's her business. That has nothing to do with giving me my registration papers. But, yeah, Zac Efron's entire career is based on that face and that body. And it looks very different than it used to. I mean... <laughs> I bet there's something... It, it, it just sounds like there's something weird behind it, which is... Because I thought you read me the article originally. It was he'd slipped on socks at his house, but... Well, the story has altered a little bit from the first time he mentioned it until recently at TIFF. And then also this new narrative of, like, he almost died is interesting because then he says, like, he had to have his jaw wired shut. Which to me is like, if you almost died, I feel like, shouldn't you have, like... I feel like there'd be more to the story... Again, people shouldn't have to explain their personal health matters, which makes me want to go on a tangent about Jamila Jamil, one of the judges on Legendary. Mm -hmm. She was doing an interview and talking about like we, ma we males, <laughs> females reproductive rights. 
And she shared a story about how she had to have um, an, an, a pregnancy terminated because a condom broke. And she, so, so she said, I'm, I'm trying to go somewhere with this. She shared a story that she was, she had sex with a man. The condom broke. He, she ended up having his sperm inside of her. She took plan B, the morning after pill, but it wasn't effective because she, which I wasn't aware of this, but it makes sense. She was um, more than 175 pounds, so it was less effective. So she still ended up becoming pregnant and then had to get an abortion. But the fact that she had to, it's like, I think it's really shitty that a lot of women are being forced to divulge their personal medical histories in mm -hmm. order to support a cause. Like, th this is an argument for why this shouldn't even be happening. Like, people shouldn't have to like share their intimate details just to get the health care they need yeah well that's just that's like that movie in called jane where elizabeth banks has to apply for an abortion right and, and then all these men are like no nope. deciding whether or not she can have it so part of me feels like zach efron shouldn't have to explain anything about his health but again it's tied into his aesthetic which is part of what he's selling so again i don't think this man should have to explain how he looks but I can appreciate why people want to know. And right. He does look crazy. <laughs> he looks, it, 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 it brings to mind other things that uh, has have happened to him. Like when he didn't he get arrested for buying coke in Skid Row? Was that him? I'm pretty sure that was him. It was someone like him. Maybe it was him. I, I think it was him. But I don't know. I I also feel bad because you know it's like Monty Clift getting in that car accident and then sure. Everybody, your There's face. so much pressure on certain people, like because of how they look. So I'm sure the pressure on him is overwhelming to keep that body up, to keep that face looking good. I still think he looks better than what he had to do to himself for that awful Baywatch movie. Or think about Linda Evangelista, who had that like fat freezing treatment, and then it ruined her face and body or something. And or Priscilla Presley with the that gasoline. That whatever. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot. But moving on, <clears throat> we were also asked to talk about the Jimmy Kimmel Emmys thing. So I didn't know anything about it. I just saw pictures of Jimmy Kimmel lying on the stage while Quinta Brunson was giving her acceptance speech. So Quinta is one of the writers on that show, Abbott Elementary. And when she won her Emmy for Best Writing in a Comedy, the presenters were Will Arnett yeah. and Jimmy Kimmel. And they had a bit, and the bit was that Will dragged Jimmy onto the stage. And Jimmy was like comatose and didn't speak throughout the entire bit. And the excuse was he lost again. Like Jimmy Kimmel's been nominated, I guess, for best talk show host or whatever, numerous times and has never won. So he was upset and got drunk. So he has to be dragged out on the stage. The bit was not funny. And then Will Arnett announces the winner is Quinta. So Quinta comes up, Jimmy is still lying on the ground. She has to kind of step over him while they're also taking some of her acceptance speech time to move him so she can get in front of the microphone. She gives her speech the end. But then there was this uproar about... That he was literally and then figuratively dragged. Right. Because people have opinions. So then we were asked what our opinion is. So we both sat and watched the entire segment. And then we watched... Um, two days later, he invited her onto his show mm -hmm. and apologized to her. What are your thoughts on that? I think it was a, a bit that went on too long. Well, one, it was, you know, I think that it's major crime was that it wasn't funny. Right. And then it just, it just seemed rude. Like this woman is ex accepting her award. Uh, and she's, you know, and also being a woman having to wear a dress and kind of navigate, like there, there's one shot of that footage where I'm like, Oh God, what if she trips? And she handled it very graciously. Uh, but it, he needed to get up when Will Arnett left the stage. And then I agree. can you imagine if, Susan Lucci had tried something like that, <laughs> you know, because wouldn't she nominated for how many data, how many Emmys before she finally won? It's like, just get over it. It's a ple what What's the saying? It's an honor to be nominated. Yeah, I think it's an unfortunate sandwich of an unfunny bit connected to an inconsiderate choice of staying on stage. And then all the other things that happen, like, yeah, when you see Quinta grab her, like the, like the, 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 the train of her dress to try not to like, so she can step over him. It's like, what if she would have fallen? Yeah. And also, you know, the, I think the most annoying part of it was 
they start the music on her ass. Like she yeah. needs to wrap it up. And it's like, well, like 10 seconds of her speech was spent like focusing on Jimmy Kimmel not getting up, them moving him, her having to acknowledge that there's this grown ass man on the ground. Yeah. While she's So to me, it's like, it was inconsiderate. But then we watched the apology. And I do think that Jimmy, of all the late night hosts, I've always thought he seems like the nicest, most real person. So I don't, like, I just think it was, like you said, the crime is doing an unfunny bit. Like, when comedy's not funny, that's the crime. And then um, inadvertently taking away from her shine. But I thought his apology seemed it's genuine. And the real winner is Quinta, like yeah. she said. First of all, she won her Emmy, which is a, a major thing. And also, because of his stupid little joke that didn't go well, she's getting extra shine and, and sympathy. So in the, at the end of the day, she's still a winner. And Chicken she dinner. she comes out of this looking even better than she already does. I agree. I You know, I think it's maybe a, a reminder and a lesson to maybe... I, I think especially men, white men, don't realize, like, the space they take up. The space up. they occupy, yeah. I, but And, yes, yeah, specifically, like, straight white men. But also, we all need to remember, like... Because that's a general... That's how I feel about driving around L.A. Like, people are so quick to... Like, you'll double park or block traffic or not pay attention because you're on your phone. And it's like, you realize that you are inconveniencing hundreds of people mm -hmm. so that you are not inconvenienced. You're like, you're not thinking about everyone around you. So in general, I think we all just need to take a step back and think, like, how are we affecting, like, the environment around us? He... I'm just surprised that he was so unaware of how awkward it would be for him to stay on the stage lying on the ground. <laughs> right, yeah. It, 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 he should have known better. Okay, moving on. Then we also, um, we did a review for The Woman King. Mm -hmm. And there have there were, like, Twitter is a buzz about The Woman King and a lot of backlash. We got a, a lot of comments that I just deleted but the backlash started before the film premiere. Well, that's my biggest issue. So <laughs> the, the the majority of the comments, which we dropped our video a day before the movie was released, and then all the, and like you just mentioned, the Twitter backlash happened before the film came out. So many comments about, don't you know that the Dahomey people, like they sold their own people into slavery, and why are we like applauding like basically like traitor like tra traitorous people and. First of all, like, have you seen the movie? The movie acknowledges, and so did we in the review, that both tribes that we focus on, both kingdoms, sold black Africans into slavery. One of them didn't give a fuck. They didn't care that they were selling their own people into slavery. The others, they knew what they were doing, but they seem, the way the film depicts it, seems like they, they, they felt like they had to because that's how they kept their wealth. And that there were key people who felt like maybe this is something we shouldn't do. Okay. But it's like some... First of all, you haven't seen the movie. The The, the film does address it more than once. Yeah, yeah. That like it's, it's, we are selling our own people and then some of them are like, I don't give a fuck. And then some are like, this is not right. It, it's quite a big deal in the movie because they're trying to make a plan to find some other... Uh, product. That yeah, they're acknowledging that this is a way they make money, and the only way we're going to stop is if we can find another way to make yeah. money, which in this movie they say is like palm oil. Right. Maybe in the, our review we didn't explain it. I mean, we did say those things, but maybe we didn't beat it over the head, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't it's, matter. It's so weird that people are like developing opinions on something they haven't seen yet. Also, they're fact-checking a fictionalized story. Mm-hmm. Number one, we are not history teachers teaching a lesson. We were reacting to a film, a, like like a fictionalized narrative feature we saw. And the bulk of my praise was on the action and the emotion that was presented. Mm -hmm. The story, which I am not a historian. I am aware that there were many like tribes and people in power in uh, black African people who were selling other black Africans into slavery, knowing full well what they were doing. But... That's not the story. Like, this was not a documentary. This was not trying to tell the exact precise story of what happened. This was more about these female warriors. Well, it's also not condoning history. Right. And, and what, uh, like, how, then you should have, if you have a problem with that concept of reality, then every movie about slavery where you see uh, white people involved in the slave trade should be out the door as well. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, it's also like we can't pick and choose. Like, so, you, you know, you just want to be mad about something, but then it's like, then you applaud other care. You know, like I was talking to you earlier today about like people um, like worship. I've never seen the Godfather movies, but I know that it's about organized crime. Mm -hmm. And then people's like people love these movies. Sopranos too. Things yeah. like that. And it's like, but you do realize that these people who you think are like your heroes were also contributing to the downfall of people. Like, so you find a way to make that okay. But then the story that I interpreted is like really trying to show a story about the strength and power of these, this, these group of women. Mm -hmm. Somehow you find a way to make that like, like invalidate that. And you haven't even seen it yet. It, it's to me that reeks of, um, kind of subconscious well even conscious racism kind of like the reaction to the little mermaid uh remake coming out is that well there are also a lot of black people having a problem with the woman king and like you know again have you seen it also uh, all the things i said and i'm not going to take away because then you know also people don't like um you know they want to reference things like trauma porn and mm -hmm. I watched the movie. I didn't get that. I, I felt it was very empowering. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, the reality is we know the history of, like, the the ripple effect of the slave trade, and especially in the United States, and, and the effect that that had. Like, it's not a secret. No one's trying to downplay <laughs> what these actions led to. I just really thought it was about this tribe of women, mm -hmm. like female warriors. There were, you know, we're also not completely in control either. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. All right. So, uh, Celebrity Drag Race. Yeah. Remember last week we were told that all of the contestants' um, secret identities had to be revealed. So we found out who they all were. Um, so, one of them is Daniel Franzese. Yeah. Who we... We know uh, from Mean Girls. The other one, Mark Indelicato. Oh, from uh, Hacks. He's from Hacks and Ugly Betty. I haven't watched either of those shows, so I didn't really recognize him. Another one is AJ McLean, who we suspected. Mm -hmm. Another is Kevin McHale, who I didn't know until he's from Glee. He's the one who's in the wheelchair. Who looks just like Acid Betty. Yeah. So I do recognize... I, don't, I only ever watched one episode of Glee... And that was the episode where they performed Rhythm Nation and Nasty, mm -hmm. which was hard to sit through. But of course, I watched Isn't it. Isn't Kevin McHale also a major basketball player or was? When I when I hear Kevin McHale, I think of uh, Joel McHale from Talk Soup. Oh. <laughs> I know there's a Kevin something uh, uh, I think who plays basketball. <laughs> I'm sure there are a lot of Kevins who play basketball. No, but I think he's from Minnesota. No, you're thinking of Kevin... Um, mm, no, that's Kevin McHale. Oh, you recognize? Uh, oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. Well, oh, isn't there a Kevin Durant? He's a very famous basketball player, right? Oh, Kevin wow. Durant. Now, now we're getting, anyway, getting out of my comfort zone. The final contestant who was revealed, who blew my socks off, there was one named Chakra Seven, who is this black woman who is stunning. Mm -hmm. And I was so frustrated that I could not recognize her because they were telling us like, oh, she's, she's like a child star, like, 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 like a very notable <laughs> child star. And I'm just racking my brain like there is no way that I don't know like a black female child star who's like my age. There's mm -hmm. just no way. And then we find out it's Tatiana Ali, mm -hmm. which is like, of course, I know who that is. I think I was surprised because she looks she just looks so good and she looks just like how she looks. Mm -hmm. But. I think I didn't think she would do something like this, and that's why it never occurred to me. But um, yeah, see, knowing that that's Tatiana Ali just stepped up the show a little mm -hmm. bit, and she that episode, uh, and she, she won the this most recent episode, mm -hmm. so she's phenomenal. Mm -hmm. Okay, Australia's Drag Race season two is uh, finished, and we have a winner that, that makes up for the trash, oh my fantastic God. season one. Season one was so bad we didn't even finish it. Yeah, we didn't watch the last episode because it was like I didn't like any of the people on the top. It was just garbage. And the only person I liked was Electra Shock, and mm -hmm. she didn't make it to the finale because she was like the underdog. Yeah. Okay, the so ironically, for the finale of season two, Electra Shock shows up to choreograph the final number, and in the top three are Queen Kong, Hannah Conda, and Spanky, Spanky Jackson. Jackson. And I have to say, this was the tightest top three in the sense that I really 
Like they all could have won. Yeah. And I would have mm-hmm. been fine with it. But the winner was Spanky Jackson. Which was a, a pleasant surprise, yeah. It's It's been a minute since I've been so pleasantly surprised at who won. And I feel like she reminds me a lot of Electra Shock. Like mm-hmm. the underdog, her drag is kind of raggedy, but she can dance and she's funny. And I wonder if there was, because there had to have been some kind of backlash because season one's so bad. And then that mysterious return of, is it Optimus, well, Optimus Prime? Who's that drag queen they brought back? Yeah, the one drag queen. Something. Art Simone? No. Yeah. Who's is just... that? One of the drag queens who was quite notable in Australia got kicked off pretty early. And then they just bring her back and don't give any explanation. Yeah. And who's... Season one is garbage. Yeah. But also I wanted to mention now that season two is over. There was a drag queen on there named Minnie Cooper, who was the oldest one. She was like 50. She made me so uncomfortable. At first I was so happy because I'm like, oh, she's going to bring it based on kind of her level of energy and uh, obviously her uh, creative craft. But whoa, yeah. She was crazy. (laughs) It made me so uncomfortable. (laughs) Also, um, all of these guest stars who are like via Zoom, I don't like that. We can stop that. We can really stop doing that. I don't need... It just reminds me... It takes the magic away from like... I don't want to be reminded we're in a pandemic. Mm -hmm. Like, just don't even have them. Well, (laughs) I feel like that must be why... Uh, th- that must have been uh, local guidelines there. <laughs> I guess. Moving on, um, I said I would address why I covered my face in your Best and Worst of Venice Film Festival review. Yeah, I didn't know you were going to do that either. Um, there's nothing uh, secret or special about it. I'm just not used to being on the camera for so long and not talking. And not being a star. <laughs> so I was making some really awkward faces that weren't my usual like reaction to what you were saying. I think I just didn't know what to do with my face because I don't ever go that long without talking. Mm -hmm. So I just thought it would take away from what you were saying. Because it wasn't even me reacting to you. Like, it was literally like me staring off into the... Like, just making, you know, the weird faces we make when we're thinking and Uh sticking your tongue out and like one eye's wonky. When you're medicated. (laughs) Yeah, I I looked crazy because that video is what, like 20 minutes long and I only say like 10 words. So... Um, I, I, I have a fun little cartoon picture of my face that I thought, why not use it? And just, but I thought, I thought it was funny. Your face keeny. Yeah. I thought it was funny. So, um, that's why I did it because I was making weird faces that had nothing to do with what you were talking about. Okay. Um, in the sorry to this man section. Oh, I had a question. You said three billboards won the Oscar, but then someone said they lost. Did, did that not? I swear that won Best Picture. I or well, was it just Francis McDormand? Now, now you can verify, but yeah, that that got corrected. So I just wanted to make sure. I thought that won Best Picture. How would you know? Uh, you can go to IMDb. Oh. Well, we probably don't have time to. Well, he's looking it up uh, it now. It says best performance man. Oh yeah. Okay. So then, so what, what? So what, what did win? Year? Yeah. What? What? What year is it? Twenty. Here, I'll let you. Twenty seventeen. Twenty seventeen. Okay. Anyway, moving on. So films that were released we didn't cover. Something called Moonage Daydream. Yeah, the David Bowie doc that oh. that came out. Uh, well, the premiered at Cannes, which where I didn't see it, and then just didn't make an effort. Next, The American Dream and Other Fairy Tales. Uh, the American Dream and Other Fairy Tales. Yeah, it's uh, directed by Abigail Disney and Kathleen Hughes. And I think it's about Ms. Disney's uh, familial legacy and creating, you know, fake dreams. Oh. Uh, oh, Blonde? Blonde, Netflix, which I reviewed out of Venice at Ion Cinema. Uh, Netflix, as they're wont to do with their uh, major awards contenders, will release them... Uh, and some other films too. It, it's been released theatrically a week ahead of uh, streaming next week. Uh, something called Drifting Home. Uh, animated film from Netflix directed by Hi- Hiroyasu Ishida. Uh, God's Country. Uh, I saw this out of Sundance directed by Julian Higgins starring Tandawa Newton uh, as a... I, I believe she's a professor and... These uh, white hunters keep encroaching on her land and things uh, kind of spin out of control because she confronts them and they 
won't listen to her. They, they insist on parking on her land because it's the easiest way to get to where they need to go shoot things. I'm looking up uh, the 75th uh, Academy Awards and it says that three billboards did win for best motion picture. In my mind, I remember that winning. But then IMDb doesn't say that. Correct. So that's... Wow. Oh, yeah. Anyway, this might be uh, an episode-long uh, quandary. Uh, moving on, I Used to Be Famous. Uh, yes, uh, I believe that's Netflix as well. Uh, Eddie Sternberg directed starring Ed Screen. Something called Riotsville, USA. This was a documentary that sounded interesting. I just didn't, uh, obviously didn't get around to watching it, but uh, built from archival footage. Um, it's about, explores the militarization of the police and creates a counter-narrative to the nation's reaction to the uprisings of the late 60s. It's directed by Sierra Pettengill. Uh, next, see how they run. Uh, I almost saw this press screening. It didn't quite make it on time. Uh, Tom George directed the film. Uh, with a great-looking cast, including David Oyelowo and Sam Rockwell. Lastly, something called The Silent Twins. Something called The Silent Twins. I reviewed this out of Cannes this past year for Ion Cinema. Uh, I read the journalist book that it's based on, which is really kind of an interesting story about these two twins in the UK in the late 70s, early 80s of... Uh, uh, West African descent that wouldn't speak to others. They had to develop their own kind of secret language and then went on Oh, a, yeah. You read that book. Yeah. Went on a crime spree, uh, a very minor crime spree, but then spent, um, you know, years uh, in various psych ward facilities because nobody knew how to deal with them. Uh, and Jody May plays the uh, journalist, but the twins are played by Letitia Wright and... Uh, Tamara Lawrence, and it was directed by a Polish uh, woman, Agnieszka Smakzinska. I think I wanted to like the film a lot more than I did, but Letitia and uh, Tamara Lawrence both give good performances. It's just, yeah, it, it does this heavenly creatures thing with anime that I, I don't know, it, it just feels like something we've seen before, and I think something else needed to be pulled out of that story. Hmm. Okay, so things we watch for fun. We finished, you uh, decided to watch the Hulu series Mike about Mike Tyson, um, which I had already started and then we both finished it. Mm -hmm. So last week I said that I thought, I had watched the first five episodes and was saying that I thought it was nearly perfect. <laughs> but after watching the full series, I do have some issues with it. But what were your thoughts? Uh, it's, I liked it. Uh, I think Trevante Rhodes does a really good job, even though sometimes the makeup reminded me of 50 Cent more, more than Mike Tyson. Uh, but the, the physique and the, uh, how he speaks and moves, I thought was really good. Uh, it's framed in a way as where he's Mike, uh, kind of performing his own story, narrating his own story to an audience. I didn't love uh, the makeup on him at that point uh, in Mike's life. I, I, yeah, because I think Mike Tyson looks better than that. But uh, And also, I really liked B.J. Minor, who played uh, the teenage Tyson. Yeah. Uh, just every scene, excellent. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think every time that they break the fourth wall and like, Trevante is looking at the camera, it's like, oh, you're, it's like your heart melts for this person. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's a lot about it I like. I would highly recommend it. Um, I was watching interviews with Mike Tyson recently and he is like out here, uh, letting anyone who will, telling anyone who will listen that he had nothing to do with this series, but this was before the series was released. Mm -hmm. So he's not saying that it's not true or he's just saying he never got paid. And I, I think much of his life, you know, Mike Tyson is notoriously very honest about mm -hmm. his behavior. Um, and there's a lot of, you know, information out there about him, including his rape trial, which he was convicted of and served time for. So I don't know that I think what what we saw was not close to reality. It's just that he wasn't a part of it. Which is weird. Which is weird. But then I think, why would I need to, be, you know, why would I need to be, a if I were some television executive looking for content and I knew that there's this very famous person with a very salacious story I could tell and I don't need to do much research to get the facts 
Why would I then spend millions of dollars and trying to and and letting you be involved and try to tell the story? Because it's respect. Oh, I agree, it is respect. But if I'm just worried about content and ratings and sure. money, I wouldn't need him. But that's important. But I, I, you know, watching you think like, oh, this is Mike's voice speaking to us. You know that like there was some creative control there so it is i think it was uh, kind of dismaying to learn that but also mike did that in the like what 2017 2018 he did like a one-man show sure where he talked about his life so it's like and part of the series is that show like we see him in modern time talking about his life so it's like they are just taking his words that he said and make building something around it so it's kind of like when you give a lot to the world like as an entertainer I don't know how much of that you think you still own. Like, you, all people are doing is taking what you put out there and assembled it in a way to tell a story. Sure, but I don't know. He's like, not this elusive person, and, it, they're, and and they're conjuring up like you know they're accusing him of rape. They didn't need to accuse him of rape. He was convicted of rape. Like, and there was a trial with transcripts and like, right. But it's like, and and he went on Barbara Walters with his ex wife, and they talked about him being bipolar and being abusive. They didn't have to make that shit up. He did the interview. Like, no, but it's just they they don't own this person. They like nobody that was involved in this wanted to be like, hey. What do you think? I agree it lacks integrity, but who has integrity? What What about business is integrous? Like, none of it. None of it. Mm-hmm. Because you're about... The, the next thing we're about to talk about is also related to that. But oh. um, <laughs> the other thing I wanted to talk about is um, it made me rewatch... You know, Mike Tyson has a very popular podcast. And a, like through two years ago, I think, he interviewed Boosie Badass, that mm-hmm. rapper. And... If you haven't seen it, it's only like a four minute clip on YouTube, but Mike Tyson confronts Boosie because Mike Tyson has a daughter who's a lesbian. And so Boosie gets on and Boosie has made comments that are homophobic and transphobic. And Mike Tyson starts talking and smoking his cigar and is looking dead at this man and asks him, like, why do you have a problem with homosexuals? Like, do you think that maybe you're a homosexual (laughs) and you're just mad at the things that you see in yourself? And he goes off on him. I don't agree with what everything Mike said because, oh, this is what I also wanted to talk about. Strangely, we finished the series yesterday and then it made me think of that interview. And then also, um, Zaya Wade, who's the trans daughter of Gab Union and Dwayne Wade, Mm -hmm. also posted photos yesterday. She, um, where she is sort of done up in a way we haven't seen her before. Like she has hair, like she looks like a beautiful woman. A young lady. Mm -hmm. And she's wearing like Tiffany, like a Tiffany bracelet. So I don't know if it's like an ad, but she looks beautiful. You know, she's a young person. But Boosie was talking, The Boosie was making comments about Zaya, saying that he thinks it's weird and wrong that like Dwayne Wade and Gab Mm -hmm. are like supporting their child this way. Like how could a, I think Zaya was 12 or 11 when she says she was trans. And it just made me think, first of all, like, good for Mike Tyson for saying something. And also, even though I didn't agree with everything he said, I feel like he has proximity to a queer person, his child, who he clearly loves. Mm -hmm. And he felt like he needed to speak up. And the fact that he felt like he needed to speak up, even though some of what he said I didn't quite connect with. I, I I applaud that, mm-hmm. and I. But probably the more positive message was seeing Zaya's pictures. I just thought, you know, and based on what Mike Tyson said, because he does tell Boosie, like, I'm not accusing you of being a homosexual. I'm just saying, like, what makes you think anyone cares about what you think about someone else's life? It just makes you seem like there's something within yourself that you're afraid of. And he's like, I. And then Boosie was trying to say that he just thinks that it's weird that they think that a 12 year old can say that they're like a different gender. And the part that Mike said that I didn't necessarily agree with is Mike says, I agree with you. Like, I also think a 12 year old shouldn't be allowed to change their gender, which I also think that there are a lot of ramifications. Like if a 12 year old wants to medically transition, are they like in the right frame of mind? I mean, th- those are pretty permanent changes, right? Like, mm-hmm. so th- it's well, more com- depending. I mean, it, 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 it's complex. I, I, I don't know what happens if a 12 year old takes hormones and then at 23 they decide they don't like, like they want to detransition. How will that have affected their, you know, physiology? 
And of course, if they got surgeries, like, you know, I mean, if they got sex reassignment surgery or sex affirming reass uh, surgery at 12, I, like you, re you can't really go back from that. So, but, but that doesn't mean that I can't um, respect and um, like someone's identity at 12. But the point is seeing Zaya in those pictures yesterday made me think you don't have to understand people you don't even have to like approve of what people do but you should be happy for people and want people to express themselves the way they feel comfortable mm -hmm. and the fact that some people d can't do that says a lot about who they are and how they feel about themselves mm -hmm. because if some little black kid who you know say is saying that i'm a woman now and they just want to look pretty and have long hair it's like what's wrong with that nothing what does that have to do with you at all like this people we're all trying to find a way to be happy and everyone's so fucking miserable anyway it's like why are, like shouldn't we be happy for someone who's trying to do something that would make them happy mm -hmm. or like, yeah, like you know i think that goes further into you know a lot of kids probably do more know more what they want than what the world's constraining them with like even tyson himself like what could he have been if he was just allowed to be this kind of sensitive kid who wanted kid. to play with pigeons. Yeah, like what? <laughs> what is, yeah, what could he have been if he could have done that? And, and not, you know, kind of usurped by the powers that be to, you know, become this. As, as his trainer tells him a to monster. be a monster. Yeah. And and not that there wasn't some some love and affection and stability in those those relationships that he had, but but also he was being crafted into something that how much of that was what he really wanted based on this is what he needed to do to get away from where he came from. He's such a fascinating person and such an interesting case study. And uh, I've always really liked Mike Tyson, but I recognize that he's done things that are wrong. Clearly he was convicted as, of as rape. As we all have. And, I don't, and I'm not making excuses for his behavior, except that I think that he's definitely a product of um, a lot of in, like outside influence. Mm -hmm. Wrong is wrong. And he was punished, but yeah, um, he's a very interesting person to think about and talk about. Okay, so we can move on to, um, you watched the series on Hulu called Dope Sick? Yep, yep. Uh, which is about? The uh, the opioid crisis and kind of the, the Sackler family that orchestrated all of that. Um, and I think I was, I, I've known about it for, since it, came out but i think i was i was motivated to watch it because of um all the beauty and the bloodshed the laura poitras doc which just won venice um and you know the the, the crisis which has not affected me person i mean i my dad you know i didn't who i didn't speak to for 14 years but after we kind of ended that estrangement uh come to find that he had uh had to he was addicted to oxy uh but I, I think, like many things, like I'm so ignorant of, um, I, I'm obviously, the, how can you not be aware of the opioid crisis, but also it just suddenly was here. It's just one of those things over the past 20 years, just like, oh, this is a sudden reality. Where did this come from? And I never took the time to really think about how or why. And I, I think watching that documentary made me, I, again, this is a television series that has some, you know, it, perhaps some exaggerated and fictionalized elements, but it's also a learning opportunity uh, that, because you had watched a couple scenes and you're like, oh, this seems a little remedial, but I think that's almost necessary to really understand the evil that, yeah. that transpired. Well, so I spent three and a half years working in the inpatient pharmacy of a level one trauma center, and I became very familiar on a daily basis of the lengths people will go to to secure narcotics and it like watching the bits that I watch with you, it just, even working in that environment, I don't think I understood how we got to that place and how insidious it is that like, we just, a lot like, yeah, all I can speak to is watching countless people for years, just like the lengths people would go to, to just get narcotics. And, 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 and do it on a regular basis. Well, and also the stigma that people just don't understand is that that shit rewires your brain, literally. And, and like, I think Michael Keaton, I think, does a really 
good performance, and I think that's a really great entryway into what happens, who's this doctor that, you know, starts prescribing it, even though in his gut, he's like, opioids are not, that aren't addictive doesn't make any damn sense. Um, but just, like, his downfall, and even even being in rehab, but still, like, trying to find these pills, like, you're just... I would highly, you know, I've had in my educational background, the uh, opportunity to study pharmacology and biochemistry. So I have an understanding to a degree. And I would highly recommend people do some light research and understanding different drug classes and how they affect the body because it it really is astonishing how caffeine, nicotine, Mm -hmm. alcohol, THC, CBD, um, like amphetamine salts, like the, the way people use Adderall or meth, Molly, like these psychotropic drugs, mushroom, like the way they affect the brain, a lot of, some of this activity is a lot more insidious than we think. I mean, th- you know, the most mild version being caffeine, right? Mm-hmm. Up to things like heroin, mm-hmm. where literally it changes your brain chemistry or meth. Like we have brain scans where people who haven't taken it and then they take one hit and their brain chemistry is different. Mm -hmm. And that shit doesn't just go back to normal after like like a hard weekend. Like you're done though. That's why some people like one hit, uh, you know, heroin, you're done. Well, and then you need methadone or something to get off. Yes. Yes. (laughs) Just to live. And it's not even to get off of it. It's like now you can only function. (laughs) If yes. you take this medication. Yes. And it, it takes years for that repair to happen. If if it happens if it, at all. If it can happen. But the, yeah. but, but the concept I'm trying to say is that this is not like, th- these are permanent changes that happen to one's biochemistry. And it is very scary. That's why I have a very strong aversion to recreational drug use. And even like, I mean, I had access to a lot of pain medication working in the pharmacy and my coworkers would take things and use them as they saw fit. And I was always very afraid, like, because even like opioids make me itch. So I never liked taking those things Mm -hmm. because I felt, yes, I was numb and didn't feel the pain, but then I also couldn't sleep because I was very itchy. Yeah, Vicodin. Is Vicodin an opioid? Uh, hydrocodone. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, Uh, yeah, I don't really care for that. But when I had my appendix out, uh, and they gave me that first hit of morphine. Oh, good. That was good. Well, Michael Jackson has a song called Morphine. I know. They were oh. so damn good to him. I was like, I was in pain for like nine hours, and then, I, you know, do, doing that thing where I'm like, I can't cry in front of the nurse. Cause I was young. If you want to be frustrated, watch a dope sick, because the reality is like, yes, this family and this, and Purdue Pharma, like Pharma had to pay out a settlement, but nothing has changed. No, nothing has changed and they weren't held criminally uh, responsible. But uh, I, I, the note of hope at the end from the Rosario Dawson DEA agent is like, this is the case that more will be built on. And, and that's, that's the important part is like they, it's out in the open now. Um, but I was, what I learned from this that I would, definitely didn't know before is the Sacklers were trying to uh, get this, uh, get Oxy distributed in Germany because Germany, they felt had the strictest regulations. strictest regulations. And they're like, if we can get it in Germany, all of Europe will be a, a, an open clamshell test or whatever. And uh, the Germans just wouldn't budge. And somebody has a line in there like, well, the Germans believe that pain is a natural part of the healing process. Because all of this was packaged as in like, oh, we have to cure people's pain. You can't be in pain, pain, pain. And, and we took that hook, line, and sink. Well, it's a very seductive proposition because when an individual is in pain, the only thing that you wish for is to not be in pain. Right. And so it's an opportunity to hook people. Yes. It's just so unfortunate. It, it's like any after school special you've ever watched, any television show or movie about drug use, there's always that moment where like someone who's peddling the drugs sees someone in need of a boost. <laughs> and it's just like you take that opportunity and they're hooked. Oh, and you, like there's a Caitlin Deaver's character is uh, going to, you know, the other thing was there was no um, infrastructure to treat people with this particular addiction so all these people were shunted into like AA where those kind of rehabilitation centers didn't really work for this drug but even at AA this Caitlin Deaver character is like two days off of Oxy and the woman running the group like confronts her in the bathroom like here you go I have some (laughs) oh but I was gonna say when I got that when I first experienced morphine and felt like my belly was being clawed from the inside out all day I was like oh we can get up and leave we can leave the CR. Oh. 
Okay, moving on, since we were talking about trans things. So last night, um, when you left to go out, I was watching um, what I thought was a... It, it's, it's on Tubi. It's called Hollywood Houseboys. And it said it was a documentary, but clearly it's like a reality show that they took several episodes and like stuck them together. So, but then I finished it and then I got caught up in this whirlwind because it's very interesting. So these, it's four young queer and one trans black people. Mm -hmm. that, that didn't come out right. Three gay black guys and one trans woman. Um, black woman they're younger they are trying to it's 2010 they filmed like four bootleg ass episodes mm -hmm. not unlike um for anyone who's familiar with chasing reality the youtube series mm -hmm. it's very much like that it except with like better that. audio it does feel like that um yeah. and so so it, it, it it's so bad and so like you can tell they're trying to create drama out of nothing and they have no budget nothing to do uh they probably don't even have secure housing uh but what really sends this into a different direction is the trans woman. Her name is Dominique Newborn, Newburn, excuse me. She, so the first four episodes are like, the first half of the film was like the first four episodes. So I don't know if they edited them down or they were only like 10, 12 minutes each. But at the end of the fourth episode, she gets upset with the executive producer and says like, I don't want to have shit to do with this. And then the series ends. And then we get an update five years later. Oh. So you had already left. And you can tell it's five years later because they look different. The guy with dreads, now his dreads are much longer. And um, Dominique was killed. Oh. She was murdered by this man. This, she at the time was 30. This was a, she was 32, I believe, and the man was 18. The person who was suspected of killing her. And it was definitely a hate crime and probably a situation where he didn't realize she was trans. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so then you saw the parts where they were being very insensitive to her, yes. like saying really awful things about her transition and her appearance. So the second half of the movie is really like them trying to, because they had restarted filming like five <laughs> years later and Dominique was in the first episode, but they didn't show it. Um, so I just wanted to bring that up because it's, it's, you know, highlighting violence against trans women of color mm -hmm. and then also how insensitive these supposed friends of hers were who were also part of the queer community yep. and they were saying these awful things to her. Mm -hmm. And then of course, five years later, when they find out she's murdered, they're all crying. They do try for redemption by, they have a woman, a trans woman who works for Grindr actually as like a sensitivity she has some role trying to promote like sensitivity amongst trans people for grinder she is part of the show helping them realize like how they can do better so they sort of atone for all the awful things they said and they acknowledge that they didn't that they had a hard time accepting her because they had always known her as their little gay boy friend sure so they always thought that she was like a gay boy who was just taking it too far which, when I was younger and I had friend, like acquaintances who were clearly, by today's standards, attempting to transition, if you would have asked me 25 years ago, I would have said, like, like it's just like, well, what are you doing? Why are you wearing lipstick? Why are you letting your hair get long? You look crazy. But, but that's why visibility and representation matters because, you know, you need to bring people out of their ignorance. So anyway, I thought that this show, this movie slash documentary slash web series deserves some credit for at least acknowledging like that they they were wrong for how they treated her. And then also highlighting this violence against yeah, that's too trans bad. women of color. Because when I was getting ready to go, yeah, like talking about her weight, just like everything. Like yeah. It was just, like, I mean, no. it's really awful. It's, it's hard to watch, actually. So I, I don't know that I would recommend watching it because I was very uncomfortable. But Dominique New, Newburn was killed. Mm -hmm. So that was sad. Um, so awkward transition. You watched um, the '80s films Fletch and Fletch Lives in preparation for John Hamm's new film Confess Fletch, mm -hmm. which we reviewed. Uh, we reviewed Confess Fletch. Yeah. Fletch and Fletch Lives are not. Fletch is okay. The first one's okay. Uh, it has its moments, but you know, uh, 
Sigourney didn't like working with Chevy Chase in a, that William Friedkin film, Deal of the Century. But uh, he, he he was never really one of my favorites. But I do have a a, a, a thing for Nothing But Trouble. Oh yeah, but mostly because of Dan Aykroyd and John Candy. Uh, but the, you know what? A, a cute uh, a. a a Chevy Chase film I do really like is Neil Simon's uh, Seems Like Old Times with Goldie Hawn. Oh. Where they play exes. Uh, that, that is a, a, a sweet spot as well. But yeah, Fletch and that Fletch Lives is just kind of, besides like Cleave on Little, otherwise straight up garbage. Uh, and yeah, I don't know. It just seems outfitted for his personality. And I don't know that John Hamm, who kind of reminds me of like he could be Army Hammer's dad, uh, didn't really fit that role either. I don't know. You know, everyone knows Army or uh, John Hamm from I guess Mad Maid Men. Mad Men. Mad Men. I don't know. I didn't watch it. And I then know. I only know him because then everyone called him Hamaconda because there are all those pictures of him and what looked like a huge having a huge penis, it like underneath his clothes. But um, then, so I think. Oh, he's in Kimmy Schmidt. He yeah. plays the, like the guy, like the guy who keeps the mole women captive, which I thought was a funny role. He's he's been in quite a few things. But then it's like now he's doing these progressive ads, and he looks crazy. That makeup and that I, I don't know what they're doing, but he looks insane in those <laughs> commercials. Uh, but lastly, you watch Marathon Man. Yeah, I put this on. Uh, you the other. Did we not talk about? Did we talk about this last week? We might have talked about Marathon Man already. I don't even know what that's about. So With I don't Dustin know. Hoffman. Where in Roy Scheider, where his brother... oh, he's in the bathtub. We mm-hmm. see his little butt. Mm-hmm. I don't recall you talking about. Oh, him. and Lawrence Olivier as this uh, ex-Nazi torturing dentist. <laughs> oh God! Uh, John Schlesinger film, very much of that uh, '70s era of uh, paranoid American cinema, but definitely worth a look. Uh, direct, written by William Goldman, uh, who wrote many, many things, including The Princess Bride, but. Uh, yeah, that was a lot of fun. Olivier is quite good, and I think he was Oscar nominated in that. Oh, and uh, who's the woman? Uh, Martha, is it Martha Keller? Mm-hmm. Uh, who I believe was a Bond girl. All right, moving on to projects of interest. So we just reviewed the movie Pearl from Ty Dolla Sign, whatever his name Ty is. Ty West. And then, uh, of course, we reviewed X, mm-hmm. his previous film. And then now you're excited for Maxine. Yeah, I'm actually... Which is a third part in this trilogy. Set in the 80s. Los Angeles. Yeah, that should be a lot of fun. Well, I liked X and Pearl well enough. So well enough. Of course yeah. I'd watch Maxine. But With three X's, of course. You know, now that we uh, even more time since we've reviewed Pearl just a few days ago, what happened in the 50 years in Pearl's saga uh, from 1918 to the 70s? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> like Harold just comes home and then like Howard. Howard, Howard yeah. just comes home and then we're just. Uh, you're excited about something called Learning to Die. <laughs> yeah, uh, Christoph Hochhausler, uh, who's out of the Berlin School of Filmmakers, uh, hasn't had a new film in almost a decade, but he made something just recently called Learning to Die. I'm, I'm assuming that'll be in Berlin. Uh, Drei Lieben, he, he directed one of those three films of that trilogy. Uh, at one point, also about a decade ago, he was supposed to direct something, a World War II drama starring Isabelle Huppert, a French-German co-production, I think, that never came through to fruition. Uh, that was, I think it was called I've Seen You Smile, where she plays a, a woman that owns, a, she develops photographs during Nazi-occupied France. Anyway, well, that will never be. But instead, we'll have Learning to Die. Lastly, I watched the trailer for I Want to Dance with Somebody, that new Whitney Houston movie. Yeah, it comes out in December. Um, you know, mm. I I don't what? know what to say about it, but um, it, of course I will absolutely watch it. Of course. Do I have high hopes? No. <laughs> um, I do think, the, the one positive is that it is Whitney's voice and music, in like, that this actor is lip syncing to her, mm-hmm. which... The plus side is that we get to hear Whitney Houston. So sure. even if this movie is cock a doo we get to hear Whitney Houston sing in a theater. But the downside is it's like, you know, watching someone lip sync. I mean, there's an entire show called RuPaul's Drag Race based on people be- being sent home because they're bad at it. And they're yeah. professionals. Uh-huh. So I don't know. Watching uh, Naomi Aki uh, lip sync to Whitney Houston might be cringy. But is the- it rated R? 
Or oh. is there no rating yet? It, this better be a rated R adult film, please. Well, my understanding... Aretha Franklin's respect. Uh, I'm assuming the family has something to do with this, so I can't imagine it's going to get gritty. Uh, yeah. But of course I'll watch it. Yeah, of course. It's just... Uh, whatever. I don't have a lot of hope uh, for this one. But anyway, we need to take a quick uh, break. Okay. Unfortunately, there are entries in the obituary section. First, um, well, we'll save this one for last. Okay. First is... <laughs> Henry Silva. Oh, Henry Silva. <laughs> oh, no, I, I messed up my list. So I was like, oh... Piero Lafo died. But no, oh my but, God. <laughs> Piero Lafo. Piero Lafo. Piero Lafo. Piero Lafo. I'm the fool. Okay. Uh, Henry Silva. He he was 95. Uh huh. Yeah. Who's, oh God, it, uh, hundreds of film credits, uh, lots of really great, entertaining spaghetti westerns, of course, but uh, almost always a villain. Uh, he hasn't been in anything, he had a bit part in Soderbergh's Ocean's Eleven. So he has he hasn't worked in twenty years, but uh, Manchurian Candidate, the original, uh, the Frankenheimer film, is must see. Have you seen the original Manchurian Candidate? Mm, that might have to be a secret film. If I you think have. I just know Denzel and Meryl. Yeah, which is okay. Oh, maybe I have. I don't. I don't remember. The, with Angela Lansbury. I don't and, remember the plot, so I can't tell you. Oh, but. okay. That's time to rewatch. I love that movie. Um, are you done with Henry? Yes, for so, Henry was ninety five. So I want to give a shout out. So um, Jesse Powell died last week. He's an R&B singer. He has four albums, but only his first one had any traction. It's self-titled. Um, that album came out in 96. And 96 was a sad year for me because I was like senior year of high school. Like just not a good time. And I spent a lot of time driving around listening to my handful of CDs. Mm -hmm. uh, and his was one of them. His biggest song is called You, which is like a slow song. But then another song that got some traction was called All I Need, which samples, um, God, I should know what it samples, but it's an up-tempo song. And uh, I loved that song so much and would play it all the time. But anyway, he died um, the day, I believe, after his 51st birthday. He had a heart attack at oh. home in Los Angeles. So, yeah, he had a beautiful voice. Um my favorite of his is All I Need. I don't know if that's on iTunes, but... All right, lastly, um, a heavy hitter apparently died. Apparently, yes, very apparently. Godard? Jean-Luc Godard. Okay, Godard. Yeah, the kind of uh, jump-started the French New Wave with his 1960 film Breathless uh, and has been a cinematic icon since then. Uh, it's worked steadily through every decade, known for, you know kind of very experimental narratives to say the least that uh kind of yeah that i that he you can't express what Godard accomplished in a uh, few words or a paragraph or anything but uh highly highly in influential uh filmmaker um who i have more of a love hate relationship with i think than you know some people very revere him very much i think a lot of his stuff um <laughs> Some some stuff is, uh, yeah, I don't know, difficult to watch. <laughs> is this a list of your favorite Th this Godard was, films? This is my top five. Okay, go um, ahead. Pierre LeFou is my favorite, uh, but Alphaville, Breathless, Every Man for Himself, which starred Isabelle Huppert, who worked with her twice, and Two or Three Things I Know About Her. Um, back when we lived in Minneapolis at this micro-cinema called The Trilon, they had some new prints of Godard. I think Criterion had just put out two or three things and um, Made in USA. And I brought you to Made in USA, which I remember you hated. <laughs> I don't remember. Yeah, you, you were very unhappy with me for making you go see Made in USA, which interestingly is the ad is in uh, bunny ears heavily here, uh, adaptation of a Donald uh, E. Westlake slash Richard Stark novel, which he hated so much that he wouldn't allow anyone to buy the rights for to adapt his his Parker character, which so we had to wait, even though people did versions of it, they couldn't use Parker's name, uh, which is why we had to wait for his death. And Jason Statham officially played the first uh, Westlake Stark Parker. Anyway, 
Well, our secret film uh, is in honor of Godard. Mm -hmm. You chose uh, for us to watch Alphaville. Alphaville. A Why did you choose that one? Alphaville, A Strange Case of Lemmy Caution is technically the... Um, oh, the full title? The full title. Wait, uh, the full title is Alphaville, A Strange Adventure of Lemmy Caution. Yes. Okay, why did you choose this one? Uh, because I remember it being a lot of fun and a little bit more cohesive. And from the golden era of Godard, you know, the 60s when he had the, uh, just uh, an amazing output of, of film. Uh, and I, the, with neo-noir and sci-fi sensibilities, even though... Noir wasn't even something we were calling those the aesthetic then. He was already kind of trying to dismantle it <clears> and <throat> deconstruct it. And I, I thought that you might have uh, an easier time watching this one. Because I'm simple. No, because it, there's there's more that you can kind of... It, it, it's less experimental. It's, well, it's, it's a linear narrative, at least. I wouldn't call it fun. Uh, <laughs> I, I didn't... Well, you know, I, I always think that if a movie makes me want to talk about it, then it did a good job. So then I guess I would say that Alphaville's, you know, like worth watching. Uh, but I guess the, I should tell the basic story. It's very simple. There's a man who's saying his name is Ivan Johnson and he shows up to this city and it's clear he's looking for something. So what he what who he really is is a secret agent named Lemmy Caution and he is in Alphaville for three reasons. One, he needs to find there was another secret agent who was sent there to do a similar task who never came back. So he's there to find that fool. He's also there because this city is run by like a computer, mm -hmm. like Siri. Named Alpha 60. It's called Alpha 60. So he's supposed to find the person who created Alpha 60. I think it's Professor Von Braun. Yes. And then he's also supposed to destroy Alpha 60. But in the process of him being there, he meets this woman named... Mm, Natasha. Natasha. And kind of like is smitten by her. Played by Anna Karina. It's important to know that Alpha 60 is like basically like mind controlling everyone in the city. And the biggest influence it has is that it doesn't want people to ha have or show emotion. Mm -hmm. So like no love, uh, you know, it's just like people are very flat. Um, of course. So he does find the other agent, but then that agent dies while having sex, I believe. Mm -hmm. And then he does find the creator of, alpha 60 mm -hmm. and kills that person yep. and then he's able to destroy alpha 60 by telling it a riddle that it can't solve which is so, po poetry the, the like, computer can't compute poetry <laughs> which is interesting because i feel like the way the computer talks is kind of poetic so i thought it was funny that that threw it for a loop but um yeah, he basically gives like the computer a riddle, and then the computer malfunctions. And like, every... like, like out of those cartoons where the robot starts smoking because yeah. it can't com like does not compute. And then uh, the final scene is basically that Natasha lady being able to tell him she love like I love you. Yeah, which end. which I really like that scene because she's like, "There's something I want to say, um, but I." I need you to tell me how to say it. He's like, no, you got to figure that out for yourself. <laughs> what did I like? I think the story is very interesting like it gives you a lot to talk about i think it looks really cool because mm -hmm. it's not trying to be like the future it feels like it is it's just paris in 1965 it, well it's shot in paris to take advantage i guess of the architecture but it it's the story seems like it's set in 1965 it's just that in 1965 this is what's happening mm -hmm. so i kind of like that that it wasn't trying to be the future um so, but I liked how it looked. It's in black and white. I liked how it looked for the most part. Um, yeah, and like the themes that are presented. What didn't I like? So I understand that the characters are supposed to be emotionless, so they would read as kind of flat and stiff. But I don't know how much of that is direction and how much of that is just like not great acting. To me, it sure. translated as like not great acting. So that wasn't very appealing. And the main character, Lemmy Caution, is played by... Eddie Constantine, who is an American. Um, he's hard to look at. He is hard to look at. At one point, he says he's 45, which isn't really far off from how old he actually was. But when you say it, when he says it, you almost scoff. Like, damn, you look rough. Well, he looks rough as hell. But he doesn't look... I mean, he looks like he could be in his 50s. He just looks terrible. He, and then 
His okay, my biggest problem with the story is he is an outsider. Like they say he's from the outlands. Mm -hmm. So he does have emotion, but then he doesn't. So I wish his character would have been more vibrant. Sure. And I and I almost wish like if the technology existed, they they could have shot him like with warmer colors. Sure. So only his character. It didn't have to be full color, but maybe like his trench co trench coat, we see the warm beige in it and his lips have a little color to them. Because he seemed more dead and more unattractive and unappealing than the people in Alphaville. That, that I <laughs> I agree with that. And I don't know if that's that was if it's a choice, it's if, a weird if it's one. on purpose because it makes him easier to infiltrate because he can navigate this world more easily as an emotionless void. Uh, but notably, Lemmy Caution was a character that he played many times before oh, this okay. Godard film um, in a bunch of pulp uh, French film, uh, but based on this British pulp novelist uh, recurring character. Um, so, you know, I think we were tied very much to Godard being with Eddie Constantine to tell this particular story. Uh, it won the Golden Bear at Berlin that year. Uh, I do really like Anna Karina, who was married to Godard from 61 to 65. And I think this was this was the year that they divorced. Hmm. Uh, but yeah, I, I, there are just so many things I like, the, including the voice of the computer. Yeah, so the computer is sort of talking throughout the film, like giving instructions. Um, it's a little intrusive at times, but I think it's supposed to be. You mean like, occupe libre. Yeah, it sounds like a very gravelly, slow voice. Mm -hmm. um, it definitely has an impact. But yeah, the story is very basic, and I think it's about the relationship between like man and technology. Oh, yeah, yeah. This, how this... we're like... We're 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 the creation the creator of our own demise. Like we're this well, it's all about this fascist technocrat, right? I I like where so he first gets into town and there's a, there's these women that escort him to the hotel room every time he goes and oh like, that was so annoying. I'm a seductress, third class. But Anna Karina shows up and she's like, I've been told I need to escort you. And tonight I'm going to this gala and you should come with. And the gala is this this execution ceremony in a public pool oh yeah they execute people who show like um i forgot how they word it but basically people who show like emotion uh that they behaved illogically illogically that's the word and so illogically means like with emotion mm -hmm. basically um yeah so then they like shoot them on like a, a what do you call it, a diving board yeah and then these women who are like synchronized swimmers go and like retrieve the dead body or or, or kill him if they if they're not dead yet yeah um I think it looks really cool, and we spent quite a bit of time after the film just talking about a lot of the ideas. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I mean, I I thought a, a few things that come to mind are that it's oftentimes when we watch older films that have themes that we recognize in modern technology, you often hear people say like, "Oh, isn't that cool that they thought that there would be this thing?" And it's like, no, who the stuff we have now is influenced by. Things like this, mm -hmm. like we like we didn't just conjure up Siri. Like there have been many movies and books and stories told where there is some sort of technology that that's talking to us, that's somewhat sentient, and that concept of AI. Like this is not Tim Cook or not Tim Cook. Who's the Apple man? Uh, Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs. He didn't create that. Like uh, just out, he didn't pull it out of his ass. Right. Like well, it's just like gangsters. The gangsters learned how to behave because they saw them depicted in the movies. Right by Eddie G. Robinson and uh, James Cagney, like that wasn't that, that that's a reflection. That's life imitating art. So the funny, so I, so I just found that very fascinating. I also think just this idea of how we talked a lot about how information spreads mm -hmm. and how that has changed the way we view the world and how we live and and you know I could go on and on and on about it, but. A, a, a movie like this really sparks that sort of conversation. Mm -hmm. I like the scene where uh, after this execution ceremony, Lemmy Caution gets beat up and dragged through that that elevator. I like that shot where he's being pummeled in the elevator. I mean, that was that was. I like that. It's. I mean, it's laughable. It's laughable, but yeah. you know, it. I think it looks good. And then when. Um, He's being carried away, and Anna Karina, somebody asks, are you crying? And she's got this one tear that rolls down her cheek and says, no. Well, she goes, no, I'm not, like, that's not an op. She says something to the effect of, like, that's not an option. Like, yeah. Like, of course I'm not doing that. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, there, 
there's just so much like I think it relates a lot to modern time and how we're all sort of out there right mm -hmm. and the only way like we all know people who the only way for people to sort of maintain some sort of privacy is to like disconnect from social media mm -hmm. but then there are consequences mm -hmm. right yeah especially if you're like a single person if you have a life and a family and then it's like, I'm not going to get on Facebook and Instagram and TikTok and put my business out there. I have kids and a life and a spouse to think of. But for people who are, especially like people who are under 40 and single and socializing, if you're not engaged in social media, that could be a, like that could have a negative impact on you. Right. Because people uh sort of interpret that as like you're trying to hide something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's it's it's sus. Yeah. And that, that's very interesting that that we're almost like forced to participate and yeah. relinquish any sort of um, like privacy and intimacy. But, like, it, but at the same time, it is kind of making us, you know, zombies a bit. Like we were just kind of complaining about cashiers uh, and, and, you know, other service workers where there was once a point where, you know, people, corporation, anybody, you wouldn't be allowed to have your cell phone on you at all times. And, you know, when's the last time you went to a grocery store and the, the cashier's on their cell phone as they're checking people out. Can I go on a rant about, like, what, like, what you're talking about and just this, like, level... Ugh, the audio got cut off. But I think I wanted to go on a rant. But I'm glad it did because I don't need to go on a rant. Oh, okay. But you were talking about... Yes, this phenomenon of like people being, people can't even stay connected when they're being paid to be connected. Mm -hmm. And that's what's scary is like, it's just become, when I started working in 1995, like my very first job, making $4.25 an hour at a McDonald's. And when I tell you how aggressively concerned they were with our customer service mm -hmm. and addressing every person who walked in making eye contact of course there were no cell phones back then but even the thought that you wouldn't pay a hundred percent attention to the customer was like just there there couldn't have been a worse crime which i don't think that's necessarily healthy either but yeah and then nowadays it's like yeah you walk into a place and like everyone's on their phone oh you know, I've been recently going back to the gym and like there's this like there are like three trainers um, who I notice often like training people, probably doing that stupid free session they try to rope you in with. <laughs> and when I tell you every single one of them is on their phone while the person's working out, mm -hmm. like literally looking at their phone and telling the person like do another one, do another one. Or like you mentioned at the grocery store, like if you give someone one second of free time. Meaning like in between when they ring up your final item and you stick your card in the machine, they're on their phone. Mm -hmm. And then I have to wait for you to hit whatever button you have to hit for it to take my payment. That's the kind of like people are like zombies. Yeah, I, I just think that culturally we're going to have to get to a point where it's like, oh, this is really unhealthy. That we have to, every free moment, we're especially in public. Like I'm sure it's different when we're lots of us are at home in a, a public environment. But it's like people can't don't make eye contact. They aren't looking around at their environment. They're they're just like even you know standing in line for that to get in that bar last night. It's just like everybody's just unless they're with a group of friends, they're just glued to their phone. It's like nobody can interact anymore. Well, you know. I think that I am very good at interacting with other people like when I have to, like I can, sure. I like, I can do it. I can be engaging and professional and it it's, it's remarkable to me how socially awkward people are mm -hmm. and how people make all these excuses for why they're socially awkward. When the reality is like, you've been trained to not have people skills. You've been trained. You're 30 to not, years yeah. old. You spent you spent the last 15 years like attached to a phone. Like you, why why would I expect that you would even know how to make eye contact or to seem interesting? But like you said, we're going to get to a point. But I think we're already there where it's like people have a problem connecting. Yeah, they need. And then the ramification to... of that is that, or the consequence of that is like they can't like like their social connections are. Maybe not as substantial as they require. Well, they require an interface. <laughs> well, yeah, you have like sort of a a buffer, 
And that's not how life works. I mean, this is not fucking... Uh, what's that movie with uh, Sandra... De- Demolition Man? Or, <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. Where they're having sex. Yeah, with, with the like that, like, like, we're not there yet. You still have to be engaging and charming. And I can't count the number of people I've, like, met in person who I may have interacted with digitally. And it's like, you are, vi- like, so unimpressive. And, like, have zero charisma. And that is really bad. Like, that's just really... <laughs> <laughs> because where's that going to get you? Well, it's just, it's, you know, debil- de- de- debilitating ourselves, but... Like, but but getting back to Alphaville, it's like, what does... Th- you know, because it's like, so Alpha 60 is programmed and sort of like sentient and then thinking that it's... But what is the function of taking human beings and removing emotion from them? Like, these creatures are not designed to live that way. Mm-hmm. So well, that is. I mean, that goes back to what Hitler's plan was: the, the, this this master race of people that were unthinking robots, basically. Humans need autonomy. Humans need to like humans need an outlet for creativity. Humans need to be nurtured, and mm-hmm. like we're so complex and emotional and illogical. Mm-hmm. So it, it's just so interesting that we have adopted technology that really puts us like it's so rigid right it, well you know how everybody's acting because the karina character at once alpha 60 is demolished is like basically spinning around in circles like in like a lobotomized yeah. do, lo, lo, lobotomized doll right and it's like this toxin that has to work its way out of her system you know that, that, you know, like that's a modern equivalent of is taking away somebody's phone you know it's like <laughs> We all know people who have like a very vibrant sort of presentation on social media, mm-hmm. but then in reality, they're quite lonely and sad. Oh, yeah. I don't know. I'm several, you know, lots of, you know, go to gay bars and you see some rue girls out there that have big Instagram followings, but it's like, oh, talking with you one on one is interesting. <laughs> it's like, I don't understand. Like, everyone's so lonely. Mm-hmm. But then it's like, you're so. You're you're so major in this like fake world we create, and you seem so important, and you present yourself like you have this vast social network. Then why are you messaging me like you're sad and lonely, and you mm-hmm. just want to have coffee? And mm-hmm. you're, it's like, well, that doesn't make sense. Like you're presenting yourself like you're like we humans are also vulnerable, and mm-hmm. you. But if you don't show it, it's like there's nothing for people to connect with. I think that's the danger of. How our lives, I've said many times before, I feel so lucky that I got a chance to be young, like in my late teens and early 20s, in the 90s, -hmm. and go out to bars and feel what it was like to have people's full attention Mm -hmm. because no one had phones. That was more than just a like. Yeah, there was nothing on their, uh, like in their hands to distract them except a drink. Mm -hmm. And that people were forced to talk to you. Mm -hmm. Because it did a lot for, like, my self-esteem. Because if I were a fragile person today... Oh, yeah. Like, to, you, you, I have to, you'd have to sell yourself on social media with how you look to get people to pay attention to you. Because unless you're, you know, posting selfies or pictures of most of your body, like, people really aren't tuning in. Well, but that's the thing. Like, based on my... You know, because I am on social media, I do enjoy it a lot because I find it funny. To me, social media, for me, is like humor. There is a... And there I is, laugh a lot. You a lot. hear me. You hear me in the bathroom, on the toilet, laughing, and, and laughing, that, laughing. That's not to say... There, there are a ton of very creative things and... Uh, yes, but the point I was going to make is... Even like my presence and the feedback I get and the response I get... You would think that... I can see how people with much larger followings... They get this inflated perception of how people see them and and their worth. But then when you go out, the point I'm trying to make is when I compare how I felt when I was 19 at the gay bar versus how I feel today, not how I feel, but like the reception I get when I was 19 and out. And those were formative years, like helping me understand who I was as a person and building my confidence. People would walk up to you mm-hmm. and talk to you, mm-hmm. and it did. And it was not that I was like a good-looking person, because uh, but it was just like I was a I was a body in a space mm-hmm. with other bodies wanting to interact. Mm-hmm. So it was just like this, like 
if I went out, guaranteed people would talk to me. Mm -hmm. As everyone else did, right? Like we all were talking to each other. Today, if I go out, which is very rare that I do, but I could go out and literally not a single person will talk to me. And I'm not the type who thinks, oh, no one likes me. I'm so ugly. I don't think that. Well, I just think that half of it is probably my, the energy I put off. Yeah. I was but thinking... the, other, the other half is like people aren't looking to be engaged in real life. Which is why I think that's what I still like really cherish getting to go out and where there's a dance floor because that is that is where that interaction still happens is people that want that that don't just want to stand around and stare at their phone or only talk to the people that they came with like that that is where that can still happen yeah I don't like that because I feel like I don't like being in an environment where I don't like being around people who've been drinking sure and I'm not sober and I'm not a teetotaler I do drink but I don't like being drunk in public. I don't conduct myself like that. I don't. I don't like being around people who have been drinking. I hate, he especially people I know because I don't like seeing people change. Sure. Like now you're like, oh, and being touchy-feely or being rude or aggressive or now you're drunk in the corner throwing up. I don't want to see any of that. That's not me. I don't, I don't know who you're talking well, about. Well, you get a little me. different too when you've been drinking, but that, that applies to everyone. It's not, and including myself, I don't want people seeing me when I drink I like, I'm already slow, like, you know, God. well, you know, I don't mean slow, like my brain. I mean, like, I'm just a very mellow person. And when I've been drinking, I just become like, like, like someone took the battery out of something. So I don't want people seeing me like that either. So that's why I don't like going out okay. because I just think that what people are presenting is not them, their, their best selves. Sure. And also the way people are meeting me, it's like, I'm, I'm not getting the real person. So I don't... Okay, sure. But whatever. The point is, I think it's... I feel very lucky that I got to be young and experience... Like, I got to learn firsthand that I am good enough, as many of us are, as most of us are. Like, we have value. It's just that, you know, we don't get a chance to... Most of us don't get a chance to be vulnerable and put our true selves out there. It's like everyone's sort of hiding behind something, which I think that thing is technology. Mm -hmm. And then when people go out, it's like they're so afraid. They're all in their little, you know, whoever they came with, which is probably not even your good friend. It's just this person you know who you go out with. Or you're affixed to your phone. It's just like, I don't know what purpose that serves. Like, how is that helpful? Oh, that reminds the the group that was standing in front of me they were so upset that they had to stand in line and um oh, the edible's gonna hit while we're in line and then like let's smoke and the, then they smoked a joint while they're waiting in line it's like oh my god and then of course seeing them inside they w couldn't get on the dance floor because they were too fucked up but um anyway like bringing alphaville back to uh, a, a queer lens a queer reading in alphaville which is uh interesting because gadar was heavily influenced by cocteau in his uh Orpheus or his Orphic trilogy, which I think you can kind of see in the visual presentation of this as well. Um, I wanted to add, I, I wrote down Eddie Constantine looks to me like Van Heflin, but did you ever see the music video for Kelly Osbourne's One Word no. in 2005? That was um, heavily inspired by the look of, and she recreates certain scenes from Alphaville, I believe. Oh, uh, then I, I can see it um, as I think about the music video. Well, uh, um, and then one line of dialogue I like because they bring Lemmy Caution. The Alpha 60 keeps trying to like quiz him and ask him questions in this room of revolving microphones because uh, they find him inexplicable. And uh, he's asked, what is the privilege of the dead? Do you remember that? Yeah. And he says to die no more. Yeah, wow. <laughs> I really like that. That applies to people who don't want to die. Sure. Um well, we need to finish up because I have things to do and uh, we're supposed to do a live video. Mm -hmm. um, so probably by the time this post, we will be live on YouTube. <laughs> Yippee. We'll see how that goes. Mm -hmm. um, it'll The live video will then post to YouTube so people can watch it after. Oh, and I'd let Shape of Water won Best Picture that year. So the, so the Wikipedia page is not right? Weird. Interesting. Yeah. Um, what do we have going this week? Uh, seeing Tar. Tar, okay. Which might end up being my favorite film of the year. And I'm so excited 
for you to see it with Kate Blanchett. And also, I think uh, press screenings of Till are this week. Till? Yeah, about Emmett Till. Oh, oh God. I know, it's going to be just... I don't know if I can handle that. You're going to make me go alone? I've... I mean, I'm very familiar with... I know, uh, you know that's going to be just grueling to sit there. I don't through. know if I can watch that. It's just going to be a lot, but yeah. Do you that, have a quote? Uh, no, but I did finish reading Perversity, which, you know, as a, it took me forever to get through this 120-page novella, but uh, it was written in 1928, and I think Jean Reese's translation is very interesting at, at times. But uh, I started reading The 20-Year Death, by Ariel S. Winter, which was published in 2012, but it's actually three novels in one set across 20 years, uh, and each uh, segment from the 30s, 40s, and 50s is styled after a different notable noir writer, um, including Georges Simenon, Raymond Chandler, and Jim Thompson, who all are authors I love. And I'm only in like 50 pages into it, but what uh, enormous scope impressive scope this is and uh, I'm, I'm very much into it so far all done yes bye